everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Design Cinema. This is Feng Zhu speaking, and we are starting a whole new series now. We're done with our storyboards. So we're moving on to something that my team and I have been preparing for the past uh, few weeks or so because we've got other work to do. So we're gonna do these as a kind of like a side thing, but hopefully you guys enjoy. So this will be broken down into a couple episodes, at least each one won't run for too long. I'm trying to keep these under maybe 20, 30 minutes due to my crazy busy schedule. So what are we talking about? Well, this is mostly for design students who are interested in a little bit of knowing how the uh, guess behind the scenes of certain things work. And the topic really is about science fiction films in terms of design and why they are hard to do and why the market don't have too many out there. For example, every year, if you look at Hollywood films, uh, there are, uh, in compared to science fiction films, far more dramas, uh, fantasy films, you know, superhero films and so forth. The science fiction films, just, just a few, like this year, I think it was by Passengers, uh, maybe uh, Prometheus, which uh, the, the alien film, right, Covent or something. Um, just a few, you know, but not too many. Life for Jay Gyllenhaal, right? But in terms of hardcore science fiction films, there just aren't many. But you look at the other types of films, there are tons. So why is that? Well, there are many factors to it, but today we're going to focus mostly from our point of view, from a designer's point of view, as well as the budget, you know, things that are really related to us. So let's jump into it, okay? So I apologize for the slightly pixelated images because now I've switched over to a 4K monitor. So even like 2K, 1K images look all small on a 4K image. Like this one, I one to one is like this, you know? But 4K, to imagine these are, uh, gets a little pixelated, but hopefully that's okay. All right, so why are there so little science fiction films when compared to real world? Well, in my opinion, okay, and from my experience, few things which we'll explain with all these images below. Okay, one, the audience acceptance. Okay, we'll get into that in a bit. Okay, audience acceptance. Two, it's very high cost, which we'll get into in a bit too. And the last one, extremely risky development cycle and pipeline. So what that means, for example, is to find designers who are versed in science fiction language, you know, industrial designers and so forth, they're pretty hard to find. The other, for example, sound effects, you have to make them up from scratch, animations, textures, so forth and so forth. All of it adds up to uh, a pipeline that's not easy to control, not as easy as say a love drama or even a fantasy film. So let's first take a look at fantasy films, okay? Now again, fantasy films are hard to do as well, but they are always slightly easier than science fiction. And here are some of the reasons. One, Fantasy films generally are influenced or heavily influenced from the real world. So here we have, for example, Harry Potter, we have Lord of the Rings, and we have Great Wall, right? We have uh, the uh, War, War, Warcraft, the World of Warcraft film that came out like two years ago, right? So these all films are all influenced from our past history. So here are some images I found that are very similar to where these films get their reference from, right? Harry Potter laboratory looks like a real laboratory from the 1800s. Harry Potter school looks a little like church-like, right? You have a, a castle from Lord of the Rings, very similar castle here. The armor designs for these Rohan riders look pretty similar to real, these are Viking armors, for example. Uh, Great Wall, the hallway where Matt Damon, everyone's walking around, looks just like the ancient China hallway. And this Warcraft city looks very similar to the Blue Mosque. I believe that's, I think that's what this one is over in uh, Turkey, right? Very similar. So their influence. Now, what does that mean? That means these designs, we don't have to resell. Okay, let me get a, uh, let me get a red marker here so I can draw on this, okay? We don't have to resell the idea to the audience. And that is a major time saver and cost saver because time really is money in this business. So sorry, I'm keeping an eye on my time here so I don't uh, go overboard. So, so going back to the, uh, these examples, right? Like a horse, the audience knows what a horse does. We grew up, most of us, right, are pretty much exposed to what a horse could do. It's an animal, how fast it is, what, how, what does it look like when it's walking, when it's breathing, what does it eat, how fast, no, I already mentioned how fast it is. So we know a horse cannot go from A to B in two seconds. It doesn't go, Pew! it just ends up there, right? It, it requires certain things to make a horse believable. But that's something the audience already accepts. You don't have to resell the concept of a horse to the audience. Whereas if you design a creature from scratch, you have to resell it because we don't know if this creature is fast, slow, um, could, could shoot fire out of his mouth, you know? All that concept has to be reintroduced. And when you talk about science fiction, it gets much trickier. Okay, so let's keep going here. For example, armor, I picked a bunch from Lord of the Rings, uh, not Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones. Armor has been ingrained into our culture history for thousands of years. We know sort of what an armor does. In fact, we can even tell a heavy armor versus a light armor, right? Video games has done that to us. 
Films has done that to us, books have done that to us, and of course history is where it comes from. So we know that this dude is probably a lot harder to kill than this guy if you only look at armor, right? Like a sword has a harder time penetrating that, this guy has leather armor. And how do we know that? Because culture has sold that to us, history has sold it to us. We know what a, what a broad sword could do versus a lance, versus a great sword, right? Versus an ax or a pike. We all know that because they're from history. And shows like Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings borrow heavily from history. They don't have funky weapons. They don't have armor that has a giant thing on top, right? They pretty much follow what history has come before because you don't have to resell. For example, this is an armor that's made up, okay? A wolf armor, but that's still not so far removed from history. They are things like this even in the real world. So they can save all their time and do really cool designs, find really good acting. You know, they don't have to resell this concept to anybody. And even when it comes to imaginary things like a dragon, okay, even that is heavily influenced from the real world. So for example, we have a, um, a lizard here, a water lizard, I believe this one's called, and we have a couple of bats. These two combined gets a little bit of this. Why is that important? Because for an animator, for a texture artist, for the sound designers, we could reference from the real world. So when this dragon's claw is grabbing something, we could see how lizards grab stuff. When this dragon is flapping his wings, we could see how bats move his wings, right? We could see how the wind affects its surface when it's flying. So like it might fluctuate slightly and we might put that into the dragon. So that all cut down on cost. That means we can R&D faster to get to the result we want versus if it's a complete made up thing, we have to do a lot more R&D in the beginning. And that of course means money. And that of course also means risk. Okay, keep moving on here. So sorry about going really fast because uh, again, I mentioned last episode, my time is like crazy tight. I gotta do some stuff right after this episode that's due like in about two hours. So drink some coffee here. All right, next one. Uh, fantasy sets often use existing locations to shoot and then we add extension or digimat right behind it For example, here's more Game of Thrones stuff uh, I'm using them not because it's like my favorite show or anything like that It's not it's because their stuff is easy to find online right now because they, they review a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff So anyways, so Game of Thrones right shoot in a real hotel somewhere probably in Italy They extend it with a map painting shoot a real uh, forest with real horses just take the background change it to a castle or something here is Italy I think and then a little bit of map painting to clean it up Versus sci-fi, this gets a lot trickier, which we'll uh, mention a little bit later, okay? Another thing, this is also a major factor in terms of fantasy, is that fantasy not only borrow heavily from the real world, right? Using culture as an advantage, so they don't have to resell, they also don't stray from the norm, okay? They don't stray from cultural norms. So here are four castles from four different films, Game of Thrones, well, TV show, um, Harry Potter, uh, Snow White, and Frozen, a Disney animated film. But they all have extremely similar castle designs that are influenced from Western Europe, right? The castle looks like a castle. And this is not even Earth. You know, Game of Thrones doesn't happen on Earth. It happens in the imaginary fantasy world, right? The Snow White doesn't happen on Earth. Harry Potter at least is Earth. But the argument I'm trying to make is that it doesn't have to look like a castle. This is not even Earth. So why does it look like a castle? Because it's cultural norms. When you read Tolkien, when you read J.R. Martin, it follows the standard of traditionally accepted cultural norms for castles. So to stray away from that, you're starting to alienate your audience. And it goes back to the beginning when I mentioned audience acceptance, right? So that's why we don't stray too far away. So when you get into a fantasy film and you need a castle, the likelihood of it looking like a castle is pretty standard. You're not going to start doing like a weird thing like this and have like rings around it and say, that's a fantasy castle. No one's gonna buy it. They're like, eh, it'll go back to something like this, okay? So even animation films like Frozen, it's a castle. And same with its creatures, right? Here are some dragons, okay? From eight different films, eight different time periods. Some of these films are actually from the early 90s, I believe, uh, this is the Sean Connery one, right? Uh, from the early 90s, this one as well. And then some recent films from The, from the Hobbit um, and some other, I can't remember what I got this from. This is Harry Potter. But as you look at it as a whole, these dragons kind of look the same, especially if you look at it from a silhouette. This also has to do with cultural acceptance of what a dragon is, probably defined by Tolkien, probably defined by D&D &D in the early 60s and so forth, that now if you do a dragon and put a lion's head on it and then put like 10 arms on it and maybe it's got a jetpack, or I don't know, not jetpack, let's keep it fantasy. Maybe it's got a um, dragonfly wings and they call that a dragon. You could do it because dragon doesn't exist in the first place. You could call it a dragon, but you have to do extra work to sell it. And most films and most IPs don't even go there. A dragon is pretty much a dragon. 
what you do is you change the textures, maybe the color, maybe the sound, and maybe some details, but you keep it a dragon. For example, the eye position for every single one of these dragons in the same location, they all have kind of these spiky things, right? So uh, some shows go away from this a little bit, I think like how to train your dragon maybe, the DreamWorks film, I think they stray from a little bit, but most of your dragons in fantasy shows are gonna look somewhere around this. Now, science fiction is a whole other story because this, there's a grounding to it, right? There's a cultural norm. So you get onto a show or a video game and you want a dragon, you're not gonna stray too far from this. I mean, look at Skyrim, look at Dragon Age, look at all these you know, fantasy games. Dragon is a dragon. There is basically a base to start with. Science fiction, no base. There is zero base to start from because you're like, I need a spaceship. What does it look like? There is no base. There is no like, oh, a spaceship has horns on the side and eyeballs in the front. There is none of it. So I pulled a couple examples to show what I mean. Here are six spaceships, essentially, from six different films. Not a single one of them are related to the other, right? We have, I, I think this is Avatar. I did this a few weeks ago, so I can't remember. I think this is Avatar. This is Star Wars, obviously. Star Trek 2001, this, uh, District 9. This is Arrival, which came out, I think, last year, right? So different from each other. They don't share any kind of similarities. You know, this is more NASA based. This is who knows, you know, when uh, Joe Johnston and these guys came up with it, you know, Star Trek and Arrival. Who knows? There's no base. There's no like a spaceship in a science fiction film must have these elements. It doesn't follow anything. So, for example, maybe the director here walked on the beach and saw a rock and go, hey, it's kind of cool, you know, and that becomes the spaceship design where maybe this one is like a dumbbell and it's like, oh, that inspired me to become a ship. And that's sometimes spaceships in sci-fi literally comes from that, right? The Boba Fett ship in the original Star Wars comes from a lamp over in Marine County. You know, I used to work up there and see the lamp every day on the way to work and, you know, see the Slave One ship basically in Marine County. So because the shape is not grounded in cultural acceptance, okay, even its propulsion system is not accepted. Uh, the Star Wars created a whole big blue engine, and you do get that in a lot of science fiction films and video games, but even that is not grounded. Like, Star Trek doesn't use that. It doesn't use the big blowing, you know, glow engines in the back. Um, for example, Matrix changed it to a, like an electric pad of some kind, right? Hold on a second, let me check my time here. Okay. So, and same thing with other designs. Here, I chose a bunch of hallways from a bunch of different films, and even a hallway. As simple as it is, a hallway's function is to take the actor from point A to point B. But in a science fiction film, there is no norm. There's no grounding for it. The only grounding is that it shares a functionality commonality, but that's about it. It's A to B. So here's Alien, and even in the same movie, the hallway is different, right? On board a ship, and then I think that's the part of the station or later, second deck, uh, deck of the ship, right? Star Trek hallway, Star Wars hallway. Star Wars Death Star Hallway versus, um, this is the, uh, the Blockade Runner Hallway, right? Uh, galaxies, right? G Guardians of the Galaxy Hallway. Here's a 2000 Wall Hallway. This is also 2001 Hallway. Um, what is this? This is the uh, Martian, I think, right? The Martian Hallway. This is uh, Gravity, Fifth Element, uh, Event Horizon, Passengers, Westworld, right? All these are science fiction hallways. None of them really share anything in common in terms of design. The only thing they share is functionality and they have a little bit of repetitive design, meaning that one shape is re repeated a bunch of times. Um, that's something that's done generally for cost, so it's easier to produce. Okay, and this hopefully is starting to illustrate to you guys why science fiction designs is much harder to do. So it just it's actually not hard, it just takes more time. Okay, it takes more time to find the language. So if you're making a science fiction film, you can't copy this, it's from Star Wars, you can't copy that, right? So it gotta be, What's my language? What is this film's language? You cannot start with the norm. Unlike, say, you're doing a Harry Potter hallway, you probably start from a castle. You probably start from a dungeon. You know, you start somewhere there and you start adding elements on top. A science fiction hallway is like, who knows? Look at this Event Horizon hallway. Who knows how they got this idea? Or passengers, right? Pretty cool looking thing. Okay, moving on. Another thing is science fiction sets are generally have to be scratch built uh, versus before I showed a lot of um, uh, fantasy stuff to be shot on set, right? Well, on location. These things don't exist. None of it exists. So either you build very expensive, huge elaborate sets like here from Pacific Rim, here's a Star Trek deck, right? Well, for Star Wars, it gets to the point where the whole thing is green, right? You guys seen the, uh, a lot of films start to do this. It's like ridiculously um, high amounts of CG work uh, because you cannot find anything remotely close to this. There's no forest you know, and all this kind of stuff on the Death Star. So you're gonna have to build all of this and therefore that makes the cost go up, okay? Now, here's the thing I mentioned earlier about 
the idea being sold, okay? A fantasy film, like I mentioned earlier, the horses, right? Let's go back here just to ref uh, refresh it here. Here, we don't have to resell the idea. We know what a horse does, what an armor does, and so forth. But on a science fiction film, you have no idea what these things do, okay? You sort of know what this does, but the, but the movie has to spend movie time, okay, that means screen time, to explain to the audience sort of what it does. And that actually becomes his selling point in the film. For example, this uh, Voicott machine from Blade Runner, that is part of the film, right? They spend time selling that versus in Lord of the Rings, they're not gonna spend screen time selling you what a horse does. You know, the Rohan writers are not gonna write on the hill and go, oh, this beast I'm writing is called a horse. It's something that we domesticated 500 years ago, and it actually could serve as a farm animal as well as a weapon armor, you know, and it, it needs to drink water and it needs to eat food, right? Nobody cares about that because a horse has sold itself already through culture. But Void Cop, actually, Deckard, uh, played by the Harrison Ford, actually spent screen time selling this device to the audience, saying that this could detect um, androids or um, what do we call it? They call it the nexuses, right? They could detect them from normal humans by looking at their pupil fluctuations and speech patterns and so forth. And that becomes an iconic design in the movie. So doing science fiction, you actually have to consider that. Same with, uh, this is Interstellar, where this planet has a very thin water, but the film actually spends time telling you why this planet is like this. Why is the water so thin, right? It has, I think, remember it has to do with gravitational, gravitational pull or something like that, right? So, and also some of this, you don't even know what it does. It's like, what is that, right? That's the core of the ship. But how do you know that? Because they have to spend screen time telling you that's the core of the ship, right? Or this, what does that do? I don't know, you know, they have to sell it to you. So this is a Star Trek engine from the 70s Star Trek. But if you just look at it, you don't know what it does. So we have to spend time telling you what it does, you know, and same with the Robocop. Okay, lastly, is that science fiction requires a lot of R&D, a lot of research and development, because you cannot, because these things have to be resold, you also have to spend time and money figuring out how you actually go about shooting it, okay? So again, this, this episode is mostly about film, so some of it applies to video games, because nowadays I'm working in films, and I, I told you guys that I'll be start sharing some of the stuff that we do on a daily basis, we're gonna be on films. Okay, back to this. So for example, The Shoot Gravity, that was a very complex film. It's, you know, the opening scene was a single take of, uh, what's this guy's name? George Clooney, right? Sandra Bullock floating around in space. And it was one, one shot, one long shot. And to accomplish that, there was so much R&D this company had to do to make it a seamless transition between CG, real, back to CG, back to real. A lot of R&D work, right? This is The Abyss. Um, for James Cameron, the, the elaborate set that to build to emerge, um, is it emerge? Immerse, right? This, this set into the water and could quickly drain the water when they need to change the set out. So a lot of work, right? Early Transformer previous to see how the heck does this work on the film? A lot of tests, right? The Martian, this is for Oblivion. So this is a large projection screen that they build specifically for this film. So this is a technology that we even looked into to hiring these guys to do something for us, which is it's a projector. I don't know how many projectors they had, but each one projects a very HD movie, essentially without any seam lines, and it plays this basically a long, super wide format film. So it was developed purely to do this set. So Tom Cruise could walk here and they don't have to CG the background. They used a real projection map to do this shot. And that costs money, that costs time and RMD. Uh, the first Iron Man movie, they had to do a lot of R&D to figure out how, you know, Robert Downey Jr. is not wearing an Iron Man suit, right? It's all CG'd in. So they had to do a lot of tests on how this actually works. Uh, versus you wearing armor, for example, it's a little bit easier to solve, okay? So that's the R&D. So lastly, before I wrap this episode up, is... Sometimes we get scripts now from in Hollywood, you're not dealing with that anymore. Hollywood's very, very mature, so they generally know what science fiction films you want to do. But now I'm working on a variety of films in different countries, and sometimes the script doesn't even identify what type of sci-fi it is. Because science fiction is too broad of a term. There are many classes of science fiction, and it affects your development time, design time, and production time, okay? And that, of course, are equal to your cost as well, your budget. So I kind of broke it down to about eight big categories uh, where I think these science fiction films tend to fit into. So the first one is current day with some science fiction elements, for example, like Transformers. You also have post apoptical which is timeless, right? Mad Max actually has a time. I forgot what it was, like 20 something. But most of your post apoptical uh, science fiction films don't have an exact time period. It tends to be timeless. 
Um, so they could put in 1980s sci-fi, for example, where video games like Fallout is kind of like a 1960s, I think, future, right? So it tends to be timeless. You have near future, which is about, let me get some coffee, which is about 30 to 50 years in the future, but it's realistic, okay? That means you spend a lot of time designing the actual science behind the science fiction. So because that's what the film is trying to sell. So in Matt Damon's film, they spend, I think, 25 minutes trying to sell the audience how they grow potatoes. But that is the selling point of the film because the audience find that to be quite entertaining because the science was real, right? It was real as they could possibly get for a film. Versus near future fiction, like Blade Runner also takes place in year 20 something, I think 2017 or something like that. Uh, but you know, something in the future, uh, but they don't actually design as if it's really the future, right? It's a, it's a future base, it's a fictional world. It's not trying to be like, oh, in year 2017, here's what Los Angeles really will look like with fire spitting out and so forth. Right? They're doing that to create a world. And then you have far future. Uh, for example, Avatar takes place 100 years. Then you have super far future, which is stuff that takes 500 years. But both of these still has Earth as a background. That means that they recall Earth. Like Alien also is the same. Alien still has Earth in it. So they'll mention things like Earth is uh, rotten or it's polluted and so forth. But it still uses Earth as a base, okay? But just different years apart. And then we have sci-fi world with no specific time. These two are kind of related, okay? So the background is just sci-fi, but the film never goes into what type of, you know, what time period are we in. It doesn't, it doesn't care. It just has futuristic things, but you don't, you don't know where it comes from. And that's not the selling point of the film, right? So you have that. And the last one is sort of sci-fi mythology, which is Star Wars, right? So Star Wars is a very specific type of sci-fi. It's not even science fiction. You know, if you talk to George Lucas, he tells you, sci you know, Star Wars is not a science fiction film. It's a mythology. That means he doesn't care about the science at all. It doesn't, I don't mean that he doesn't care. It doesn't really go into that. It doesn't have things like anti-gravity. It doesn't care about there's no sound in space and so forth. It just makes story because it's a cool world. And Star Wars, therefore, is a pretty difficult film to design because it doesn't follow sci-fi or classic sci-fi rules. You can kind of go anywhere with Star Wars. So therefore, you have to control that. Otherwise, it gets too crazy. Okay. So these are sort of the eight giant categories that I put down. And then I sort of did a quick thing about costing, just kind of fun thing for you guys to see. I do this for my clients, actually. But, you know, since it's here, I'll show it to you guys. It's kind of like those, um, you know, those Yelp how expensive a restaurant is. I kind of did the same thing. So basically three major factors govern cost in these productions, which is dirty versus clean, dark versus bright, existing versus non-existing. When you start putting this together, you start to affect the cost. So I did a little Yelp marker here, right? So one money sign is 50 million USD, okay? So if you're doing current day plus very bright, it could be very expensive, like Transformers, $200 million film. You're doing current day, but it's kind of dark. You could save some money. Uh, I guess Matrix and some of these films fall into that category, I guess, right? Keep it dark, so your CG could be cheaper to produce. You're doing post apocalyptic world and bright, a little bit more expensive, post apocalyptic dark, one of the cheapest films you could probably do, okay? So destroyed world, everything's gone, and then you're always shooting at nighttime. So in a, in a way, Blade Runner could even fall into a little bit that, that right? So science fiction, but cyberpunk, the world's kind of decrepit, you know, it's all running, it's always raining and so forth. It's a relatively low cost film to do. So uh, near future, real, bright, expensive, near future, fiction, dark. Oh, so actually this is Blade Runner right here. This is, that's Blade Runner, right? So you can see the money sign. Uh, nowadays, 50 million, you could probably do a Blade Runner, okay? Far future, bright, very expensive. That's your avatar. Far future, dark, also not that cheap because of the amount of design required to do far future, okay? And of course, you get to the most expensive kind of films, which is sci-fi mythologies, bright, then you're dealing with 200 plus million, which is your Star Wars films, you know, cost a lot. You could keep it a little bit darker, but it's still going to be very expensive because lots of design, lots of worlds to develop, and even if you try to save money on dark, it's not going to be super cheap. So when doing a science fiction film, you can see here, these are the ones that are much cheaper to do. Okay, so you do uh, War in the Future, the World's Destroyed, and some kind of dog is trying to rescue the daughter, right? Relatively cheap move to do. You're trying to do an avatar, we have to do a whole planet from scratch, and everything's in the daytime. Uh, you're going to need quite a bit of development uh, cash to do that, okay? So anyways, that kind of wraps up this episode, a quick one. So what I'll do next week, and I'll hear some of my own work here. Next week, I'm actually picking a made up, uh, not a made up, we're going to pick a novel, okay, just like what we did with Legend and I Am Legend for the storybook, uh, storyboard, and I'm going to show you guys the pipeline that we use as a company to approach science fiction design, how we break it down, the kind of research we do, 
the kind of references we look at, the, the design decisions we make, and, I, and my team helped me put that together. So I acted as an art director, and I'll be showcasing the work that my team has put together, as well as my own notes, um, everything. You know, everything we have done, I'll show it to you. Uh, but keep in mind, it's not a real project. It's something we did in a week. So it's whatever we did in a week, but I will showcase it to you guys. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I uh, brought some insight, especially if you're trying to get into this business. I think it's kind of some fun stuff for you to understand. So, okay, until then, I will see you guys in the next episode. This is Feng Su speaking. I will gotta get back to work. All right, bye guys.